Hey, good morning, Margov. So we're gathering around for the monumental discussions about the effectiveness of the sanctions by, um, I, I guess we can classify it as the West by which we mean, I guess, NATO, Europe, their allies, as well as the USA. So we'll classify that as the West. So please go ahead, give us your overview on how effective you think sanctions are generally and in this specific case in the Ukraine-Russia situation. Okay, Paul, I do not think the sanctions are going to be effective in deterring a mastermind like Putin. Putin must have calculated all of these sanctions because the sanctions are the only thing what the West have in the quiver of arrows. They do not seem to have a stomach for an upfront face-to-face -face fight, and they have proven that by not deploying in Ukraine or not accepting even the application for no-fly zone. So as far as sanctions are concerned, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Putin had, for, had foreseen this. And at the moment, they're, they're, the sanctions are still mountain. Uh, they have sanctioned oligarchs. Uh, quote unquote oligarchs, which are close to Putin and who are basically seen as the bank for Putin to run his political machinery, uh, which includes some of the big names like Abramo Abrahamovich, who owns Chelsea football team as well. But at the same time, the worst possible impact could be on the banking sector, which the Russians seem to have figured out to some extent by integrating or proposing to integrate with uh, the Chinese system. And even India, for that matter, is trying to bridge that gap uh, between SWIFT and India's own system, because India has two or three of their own transfer protocols. So I wouldn't be surprised if Modi uh, reaches out to Putin, basically offers a similar system. Uh, to be uh, precise, I'm talking about uh, NEFT and UPI systems. They, they have pretty long uh, expansion. I'll avoid that. So if something like that is worked out, I don't think the, the banking system will be under as much of pressure as the West would anticipate by kicking them out from the SWIFT system as a whole. So, Paul, any thoughts on these? Yeah, look, I think it's an interesting point you make. I mean, China and Russia both have their own financial protocols for that kind of banking. It's perhaps a little bit ignorant of the West to assume that they have a monopoly on a system. And for a long time, I guess America has been able to control the financial systems based on one, wanting to stop money laundering and terrorism, but also they just want to obviously have the stable currency that enabled them to call the shots. I think those days, very close to ending. I think a lot of the sanctions that are being imposed are such that there's a lot of airlines now in a very vulnerable position because they've got a lot of aircraft sitting in Russia and its various controlled states. So those aircraft may or may not come back. I think what's very interesting is, you know, in democracy, the pen sharpened than the sword, but as one of my friends, Mike Mangan, in his uh, report wrote this week, an audit on autocracy um, has a, a sword that's much sharper than a pen. I, I think it's interesting that we uh, look at things like, you know, aircraft potentially getting held up, financial systems being assumed. I'm not sure how well they've considered uh, the long-term impacts of these sanctions. Um, I'm also not sure that they realise on a purchase um, power parity basis that the Soviet Union, coupled with other nations such as China, um, uh, Iran, the Saudis throw in North Korea, um, China's influencing a lot of the African and Pacific Island states. It's very active in Indonesia at the moment and it's trying to consolidate power in Indonesia to back to a, a, a central area where it has more control like America previously did under Sahara. So they know the strategic power of Indonesia within Southeast Asia, which is about 40% of the of Southeast Asia combined economy. So I think it's very uh, interesting that NATO, Europe, the USA is pulling out these sanctions as in affecting sanctions. It's placing, in my view, a very large hedge 
on a very soggy lettuce leaf that it wants to slap um, Russia with. And I think Biden clearly, like you said, has considered this. I, I guess the lasting, the, the, the long lasting joke is NATO non action talk only. I, I guess the funny thing is that it's actually, like in most comedies, it's true. And when you look, when you consider, you know, I remember when Russia first went into the East, eastern states of Ukraine, you know, at that point, you and I sort of differed where I think, you know, I sort of raised the idea, I think he's going all the way because there's been a very sloppy diplomatic type response that just sort of showed a lack of unity. So Bargov, I guess what I'm saying there is, you know, we're now over two weeks in and Putin and his boys are still rolling around their ops room having a, a hell of a giggle because I think, I think the West has perhaps elevated itself to a special status of um, delays and fornicating. It's not really thinking uh, how this is on the long term. It's thinking how it is one public relations conference at a time. Back to you, mate. Paul, uh, it's interesting that you pulled out a couple of examples, Iran specifically, and that leads me to question on two parts. First, if we look at some of the examples of countries which have been hit really hard by sanctions in the past 20 years, uh, if you compare that, how does Russia stack up and what actually happened in these countries? Iran, for example, has a GDP of over 450 million, uh, sorry, for 450 billion dollars, uh, in the, on nominal scale, and they have uh, a population close to about 100 million. Now, despite all the sanctions, their economy is not doing too bad, especially when compared to similar sized economies in Southeast Asia. They, they have kept up their economy, their industrial uh, prowess is out in the open. They have demonstrated that they can stick it out despite all the Western boorish imperialism hitting them with sanctions just because they did not really you know, tiptoe to their own dance like the, <laughs> the, the, the predecessor, the Shah, Shah Falavi did. Now, uh, if you compare that with Russia, uh, Russia comparatively is far more integrated with the Western economy through their pipelines and the economic linkages, the banking system and whatnot, which Iran was not. Iran was hit with sanctions back in 1979 itself. Of course, they became far more rigorous with the nuclear program in the early 2000s. So comparatively, uh, Russia is far more integrated. They export about $600 billion worth of goods, uh, out of which about 50 to 60% go to the West, mainly the EU, the UK, as well as the US. Now, uh, is it, uh, was it worth taking the risk uh, with the sanctions and getting, uh, get, getting hit with so many sanctions which will affect the economy? Of course, that may not be enough to uh, ruffle Putin's feathers, but the effect will be felt at the ground level especially common people who depend on these linkages who are invested heavily into, uh, let's say, retail sector or oil sector for that matter. Uh, Paul, that, that's, a, that's an open question. Uh, because yeah, the, and, yeah, look, I think the reality is sanctions are going to have an impact. It, 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 you know, I'm not debating that idea, that concept. Obviously, they're going to have some impact. But is it enough to counter the fact that Russia has taken back one of the Soviet states? Is it going to deter further Russian actions? I mean, we have to look at America and, and, and NATO and Europe and their allies are making comments, you know, when the hospital, the maternity hospital was, was hit by Russia, it was, you know, a human rights atrocity, potential war crimes. But when Western forces did that in Afghanistan, it was an accident for which an apology would suffice. Um, and the West is in a position, if we look at all of the Western countries, there's a lot of moral degradation, um, some of which occurs in some of those nations. It happens in every country, but not to the same degree as, as appears to be happening in some of those free thinking capitalist states. You've got the West ignoring um, or disguising corruption in, in, in the markets and, in, and amongst lobbyists and multinational businesses. 
yet they hold themselves up to be some kind of, you know, whiter than Saint White, um, but they also want to turn a blind eye on the massive wealth divide in their countries. And, you know, we're, we're basically also turning an eye on where we're, we're, they're heralding a system called democracy, but it's in, in a couple of the major economies, the political parties are so bipolarized and lobbyists and, 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 in, and inept voters choose, well, the inept voters choose between dumb and dumber and the lobbyists manipulate those that are controlling political parties. Yet the West wants to stand up on a soapbox and preach how much better it is. But, you know, they've got to start to look at, are they potentially lining themselves up for a crash landing when they spot in with a grin? Because they are forcing Russia, China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, North Korea, um, several states in Africa, um, you know, countries that may not be politically aligned, but are indebted. And, and the West always states about, you know, China, for instance, um, making countries dependent on them because it funds an infrastructure they can't repay it. There's another way to look at that, and that is you're bringing them out of poverty. You're giving them the infrastructure they need and you're building a friendship and a relationship. And I, I can't help but think that I'm not sure that the West is actually considering what are the long-term impacts in, in forcing opposing economies and political systems to merge and come together. The last time that happened, it was called the Cold War. Um, there was also the time it happened where it was wars in Vietnam that with hindsight probably were a lot overrated in terms of the spread of communism. Sometimes you're better off letting the weaknesses in the system fight themselves, um, which kind of happened in Afghanistan, by the way. So I think it's a, it's a very difficult position that the West seems to be all about, you know, the next media announcement and the next time a politician speaks to the pulpit. But if you look at a strong leadership coming out of Russia, China, um, you know, maybe fanatical, but Iran, um, even the Saudis, there's only so much you can control the world based on your own values before you have to say, am I elected by who? to control everybody else. Is that my, my legitimate role or do I think it's my role? <laughs> okay. So I mean, there's my candid thoughts, Bogo. I think the West is embarking down a path that it has a very ignorant stance from where it's going. It's very hard to disagree with you, Paul, because uh, West has a construct called democracy, which you rightly addressed. And time and time again, it keeps tripping on that construct and people do not seem to buy it anymore, uh, especially starting with China. I mean, China has proven that uh, not accepting a Western construct isn't really a bad thing. And they ended up uh, being the biggest economy in the world, quite officially on a PPP basis, as you rightly said. And uh, I, I guess I guess you're right on the money there. I guess they, they are barking up the wrong tree this time around. And I don't see Putin budging. Now, uh, I may take an alternate view in terms of Putin's own strategic uh, approach to Ukraine, uh, primarily because he's, he keeps repeating in his speeches that uh, um, Ukraine is no nation at all. It was supposed to be part of Russia as a nationhood. That seems to be driving his uh, need to acquire Ukraine back into the fold. Paul, on the grander scheme of things, did he overplay his hand? Up until the invasion of Ukraine, I always thought of him as a mastermind who understood long-term military occupation, deployment, is going to grind a major power like the US or, or NATO for that matter into the ground without an exit strategy. Is he, do, is he committing the same mistake in Ukraine? Uh, I ask this especially because you, you, you understand military uh, strategies much better. Uh, did he overplay his own hand? Well, I think the real difference between an autocracy and a democracy is it's the same guy. The political leader and the military leader is very much the same guy. Whilst, whilst in the United States, on paper, it's the same guy. The reality is you've got a lot more political pressures and you've got a lot more processes to go through to um, deploy. I think what everyone is 
misunderstanding is that if he wants to pull out, he can. He, he can do that and he won't see that as a, as, as a massive loss because he doesn't have a political opposition of commensurate power. So he's going to do what ultimately is best for the Soviet Union in his eyes, which everyone else calls as Russia. Now, I differentiate between the two because if we say he's gone too far, but in the same breath, you said that it's about going in and getting people of, of you know, or lands back of Russian history, then he hasn't gone far enough in his eyes yet. There's still others. He's testing the waters where NATO lie um, because they're just boundaries. NATO declares those boundaries. Doesn't mean he has to agree with them. Um, NATO in the West has been extremely arrogant and failed to communicate effectively. They spoke a lot. They didn't listen to uh, Putin and Russia's views. They elected to ignore a lot of atrocities being committed in the eastern regions of, of Ukraine by Ukrainians. And now the, the, the West media is trumping up that there's only one evil dude with horns. Um, and, and you have to be extremely ignorant to think um, that to be the case. Sadly, it appears most Western media, most Western analysts, and nearly all people based in the West can only see one uh, viewpoint on this. And that's sad. That's very sad for a potential outcome. And it's very sad that that kind of ignorance is manifested by media that's extremely biased and it's dressed up as objective media outlets when the reality is it's it's propaganda machines, yet everyone laughs at China and Russia having propaganda machines. So, look, I think we're in a situation now where has he gone too far? It depends who, who you're thinking about, but in terms of who he is, where he is, is he getting a bigger backlash in terms of sanctions? You say he workshop, workshop those. I don't think he necessarily workshopped those to the nth degree. I think he's, he's now working out um, you know, move arounds, but I think the least of his concerns are sanctions compared to uh, military conflict. I think it's very interesting that most of the weaponry they've deployed so far and, and, uh, are old weapon systems. I think he's at some point holding back, you know, better troops and better equipments for for bigger days. So your your question is a hypothetical one based on. Your background, I, I personally think he thinks differently. He's thinking about Russia, the old Soviet Union. I don't think for one minute he's going this alone. Um, you know, what China says in the media, uh, is that what they're thinking? I don't think so. This is in their best interests. Um, quite clearly, um, anything that depowers America by empowering some other form of power is in China's best interest. So I think we're in for very interesting times. And I don't think uh, Ukraine and Russia is going to play out the way um, NATO and the West thinks it is, where they're going, oh, our sanctions are hurting. OK, we're pulling back. Sorry about that. Yeah, you just go and keep um, advancing NATO um, borders uh, wherever you like. That'll be fine. I mean, little kids that primary school, you could probably get them to see it differently, yet the Western world isn't prepared to try and see this differently. And through Putin's eyes, um, yeah, he, he, he understands the impacts of being in, in, in a protracted battle. Russia has a history of it. Um, if we think back to a certain world war, but um, I think this is going to be a very, very committed Putin and Russia, and I'm not sure that we're seeing uh, decisiveness from the West that's going to deter him at this stage. Uh, well, that leads me to ask you a final question to get your thoughts. 1979, USSR invaded Afghanistan. A few years down the line, the US armed the Mujahideen rebels in yes. Afghanistan with stinger missiles. Will yes. the Javelin be the next stinger missile for Ukrainians? I, I think it will be because, again, I talk about the soggy uh, lettuce attack on, uh, you know, the, the, the counter response was to throw 
the equivalent of wet lettuces and, and, and tissues infested with oil and think it was going to deter. And then the second phase was, hey, let's send, send over a few troops to train in a few, in a few um, you know, anti-armored weapons. I mean, it's who's controlling that? Um, how well are those troops actually using them, trained? How well can you be trained in a, in a system where they're arriving in boxes on a port and you're at war? Um, so I think there's the reality is, again, it's just ill-considered. It's public relations based. It's, it's an extension of inadequate preparedness and incompetent response and trying to fight an autocratic, powerful um, military by political um, statements at lecterns, trying to appease that you're doing something, look at what we've done, we've sent missiles, look what we've done, we've done sanctions. Uh, so far, that hasn't helped a lot. And I think the sending in weapons um, that are uncontrolled into a what is a totally chaotic war situation at the moment. Um, it, it's just an extension of inadequate response and even less thought. And it's what the point you know, we've been making is some of these powers think with great unity and long-term thinking. If you look at potential manipulations going on in Indonesia by China, and if you look at Russia deciding to make this move in the Ukraine, they consider stuff on extreme long-term, you know, China's famous for having its 50 and 100 year plans. The only thing that that coincides with in Australia is the length of time it, it, it's taken to decide that Sydney may need another airport. So I, I think that this situation just further exacerbates the fear that I have that this is potentially... I mean, myself and a very good mate, I'll just call him Gary, because I'm not sure he'd like to be quoted in full, but as soon as the Ukraine invasion occurred, we had the long chat. Is this America's sewers moment where they withdraw back their empire to perhaps where it belongs and its trend line goes down? Or, or is it a rallying moment like Pearl Harbor? And the more I'm seeing of the response by the West, uh, what I'm expecting long term, unless unless I wake up in the morning and see a whole heap of incredible response plans that they've been concealing, and here it is, and we're taking action, then I fear greatly this is going to be the West, not only America's sewers moment, like the old Brits had in, historically, but this is also potentially Europe's because you know they've lost England, and if there isn't unity and decisiveness, people don't hang around groups with poor leadership. So I think this is a defining moment in history. And, and sadly, I think the West is going to look back at their lack of response, their lack of unity, but also the atrocious way they handled trying to not have discussions whilst pretending to have discussions about incorporating the Ukraine into NATO and how they ignored what was really going on inside the Ukraine and could only see it um, with one eye, and, and, and it's very difficult to see things um, through your glasses, regardless of how good and expensive those glasses are if one eye is always closed. So a long-winded answer, Bugger, but yes, I, I think it, it potentially it, it is that moment where these missiles are going to become yet another um, sign of ignorant failure by the West. Thank you for that, Paul. Uh, I think we can call it a day here. I think we should. Take care. Thanks for the call, mate. Cheers.